Welcome, everybody. Looks like a couple people starting to trickle in. Thank you very much for attending our shop talk today. Very, very excited about this shop talk. I really like to encourage people to see these webinars as sort of a meetup. Um, you know, we're all uh, like-minded and obviously have questions and, uh, you know, part of the same community. So by all means, talk amongst yourselves, ask each other questions using the chat window. As far as questions to either myself or Elizabeth, I do ask that you put those in the Q&A. So today, super, super excited, have Elizabeth Chang with us, uh, who is from the Eastman Kodak Museum. Uh, great. So um, Elizabeth, thank you very, very much for taking the time to be with us today. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am excited to be here today. I'm from the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, so upstate New York. Feel free to look me up. I, I love to um, show off the museum and all of the things that we're doing there. So, Can you tell us uh, what exactly it is that you do at the Eastman Museum? Sure, yes. Uh, my formal title, I guess, is museum photographer, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a catch-all. Uh, my main goals or my main responsibilities are ongoing digitization of the various collections we have at the museum. So we have five collecting departments, the library, the photography collection, uh, moving images, technology, and what we call the legacy collection, which is everything uh, related to George Eastman as a person. So the museum is actually an amalgam of two buildings. So there's the historic house, and then attached to that is um, muse a museum with the vaults and the archives and exhibition space. I do digitization. Um, I also do a little bit of event coverage for various events that happen at the museum. And I do a lot of documentation of the, uh, the exhibitions that come through, of the things that happen at the museum. Part of that, which is kind of new in these last few years, is that we've always done uh, exhibition installation images of various exhibitions, so still images, but recently we've added uh, virtual tours to, to the mix. So I guess this is where this, um, all of this comes into play. Yeah, 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 very exciting. Um, that's great. So basically, uh, we, we have you know, a lot of uh, photographers and enthusiasts, uh, obviously you know, everybody uh, in that community knows the name, uh, George Eastman. And what I would like to kind of focus on today is a couple of things. One, I wanted to uh, share my screen and, and, and look at the models that you created uh, for the museum, as well as talk about the use case and how you're using it. Because I think we have got uh, a lot of photographers with us today and people who are incorporating Matterport into their own uh, portfolio of work, uh, you know, not just uh, using their DSLR anymore. So uh, let me go ahead and do that and just share my screen real quick. Everybody can do this. Uh, you don't have to do it now, but I definitely highly encourage uh, going to, uh, you can see it on my address bar here, eastman.org slash virtual dash tours, where you can find the different uh, uh, tours. You've got three of them on the site uh, right now. Is that right? Uh, those are the three ones of, the non-exhibitions, and then for each exhibition, past and current, we also have the tours of each exhibition. Yeah, very cool. That's great. Uh, so kind of an archive of, of uh, the exhibitions that you've had. Oh, that's great. Uh, so I just want to go into uh, the, the mansion tour. I think this is one that I looked at and really, really liked. So you, obviously you've got uh, things matter tagged, uh, you know, more information about this. Uh, looks like you've got some audio uh, in here and uh, some stuff here. That's great. What I wanted to ask you about is obviously as, as a photographer and one who's, you know, been doing these, uh, these Matterport models for your museum, uh, is there anything that you think about as you're going through the space in what you want to capture and how you want to capture it? Um, um, there's a, I guess the first thing that popped to my mind is I, I've been at the museum for coming up seven years. So I, I walk through this, all the areas pretty much every day. And I've, um, I've had the pleasure of working with a really great team. So you might notice here that there aren't any stanchions and it seems like everything's been sort of tidied up. And we do a lot of prep work before we record any of our virtual tours. And so 
Um, it's not just me going in and just, you know, wandering around. Um, it involves the exhibition staff, the curatorial staff to a certain extent, uh, also, you know, object prep um, to help move things, the facility, the maintenance department to help us tidy and clean everything. So uh, it really helps to be familiar with the space beforehand and then to know all of the all of the nooks and crannies, all of the the um, the points of interest, I should say. So uh, there are some, I feel like there are some points of scan or scan points, I should say, that wouldn't be typical, but they are uh, spots where we we've noticed that you know people like to stand to take very iconic images, or uh, you know like they're just uh, a good you know point of view to see see the space. So um, I like to include those because we think of these tours as a you know if you can't make it in person, then you can sort of get the the feel of it online. And uh, if you were in person, you'd you'd be able to you know see all of these spots. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. I uh, I like this one, uh, especially right here. Looks like you have this one, um, you know, pushed really deep into the corner so you can have this perspective kind of looking down, because that's, I'm sure, when people are actually there at the museum, they come up to this area or uh, the other one that I was at, you know, close just to kind of have that perspective. So to kind of keep that in mind, and, and offer that to your virtual visitors as well, I think is brilliant. So this is basically how it was uh, decorated for the holiday season uh, this last year? Yes, this was uh, last year's holiday season. And um, you might notice it's a little bit different. We didn't go um, all out with removing the stanchions and everything this time around, but mm -hmm. uh, we also did use this particular model uh, for a, it was, it was, it was a seek and find. So we had little uh, wrapped up gifts hidden throughout in the actual space. And while we recorded, um, we made sure to record spots where people were walking through the uh, digital space that they could find these things. And so it was, um, it was a nice way to sort of give people a chance to, to visit and to, to do a seek and find without having to you know, be on site. We, were, we weren't um, fully open last year. So. Is that uh, is that what the what these QR codes are for? Uh, the QR codes are mostly for the uh, for, uh, the audio tour. Okay. So. I can I actually tried this. I um, I can put my phone up to the screen right now and actually use that QR code, <laughs> uh, which is kind of neat. I, I don't know if that might come in handy to include you know the virtual visitors uh in in some way or another so they could also uh partake in in the audio tour uh as they're virtually going through um i know there are ways of embedding an audio tour into the model itself so that's another way you can't uh you don't you don't have to you know do it the same way and this this area in this uh in this tour is uh closed off from visitors typically for day-to-day -day visitors it is closed off uh, okay so the other tour that I was able to go into this area, uh, I didn't actually show it, but I've, you know, I've been there before. I, I looked through the models. Um, that's not typical. This is more typical. Yeah, with the stanchions, it's more typical. Um, and we wanted to treat the other one with the, without the stanchions as uh, not only a tour, but also a record of the, the mansion at the time. So mm -hmm. for, for our own archives and for you know, um, document keeping and that kind of thing. So. Forget about you know Matterport for a second. This is this is to me just amazing. Uh, you know you don't really get to experience uh, mansions from that time period um, very often, and and to see it even uh, you know even virtually, not not being there, I can only imagine you know what it's like there. And uh, this is really really impressive, um, and. You know, this is this was his house. This is where he lived, right? It was, yes. Let's talk a little bit about your use case and how the museum uses it, because uh, I definitely, you know, want to encourage, uh, you know, everybody on the line to kind of understand that, you know, real estate isn't the only play with Matterport. Uh, there are so many different use cases, and a museum is a really, really brilliant use case. 
uh, in my mind, as, as you can see, right? I mean, you're, you're walking through here and you're really experiencing this history. So how, how are you as a museum benefiting from these models? We definitely noticed a huge uptick in online visitors. Uh, I think the, my numbers aren't super accurate as of today, but it's um, over 14,000 and counting individual visitors um, to, the, to the online tours page. Um, so there's the added bonus of that. Um, and I think everybody knows that the last three years have been jarring for a lot of museums and galleries and um, archives. So this is part of, uh, this is part of our digital engagement uh, strategy to be able to offer uh, people a chance to see the museum without being on site necessarily. Um, a lot of uh, school groups have used this as part of their learning toolkits too. Uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult to get large groups to travel. Uh, and so, you know, this is a chance for uh, school groups or different uh, clubs and groups to be able to visit places that they normally wouldn't have um, a chance to visit. Um, and insofar as the exhibition spaces too, um, we've found that it's, um, it's not just for documenting, you know, what's on our walls and what's, what's in the collection and uh, stuff like that, but um, it's also great for the artists themselves to be able to, you know, share this with their, with their fans, with their, with their friends, with their family, uh, to show that, you know, this is, this is my, my work, you know, it's, it's part of this um, exhibition, it's, it's currently going on, and, you know, again, sometimes not everyone can come visit in person, not everyone can make it to the opening, but uh, it's nice to be able to be able to share that to the world. Yeah, and you mentioned also the, the exhibits, right, that, that come through, and you've kind of, in a way, archived them in this, you know, virtual space, you can offer for people who, you know, may have missed it, uh, you know, member tours, um, you know, I think we, we talked about offering uh, tours of parts of the facility that are, are not open to the general public, you know, that can also be a really cool use case, right? Yeah, actually, we've done, I believe, two behind the scenes member tours. One was the photo studio where I spend most of my days. Um, and the other one is one of our offsite, um, off-site facilities. And so those locations are, they're, they're in the staff area, so they're not typically open to the general public to walk around, but as a, you know, it's an added benefit of being a member of the museum, we wanted to give something, you know, a little more behind the scenes special to the membership. And so we recorded both of those spaces. Um, I'll use the studio as an example. So I recorded the studio, sort of, you know, dressed it up, made sure that there wasn't anything, um, like, you know, weird pieces of map board hanging around and stuff like that. Um, and then use that model, take people on a tour of the space. So um, it was great because we were able to reach a lot more members who are out of town or out of country. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just kind of one of those things where Typically, if we were to do something like this in person, the numbers of, you know, packing a bunch of people into a, a working space is kind of tough too. So yeah. we'd, we'd be limiting numbers, but you know, with a virtual, a virtual behind the scenes tour, you can sort of have a larger reach. Just wanted to take a quick peek at the last one. Um, uh, of course, everybody uh, should take advantage and, and you know go here uh, to look at all the uh, models at your leisure. Um, so this is the lab where uh, you guys are doing a lot of the archiving? Uh, this is the conservation lab. So okay. this is where we do a lot of uh, conservation work. Um, so that, and that spans from um, repairing damages to cleaning uh, pieces to uh, we do uh, different types of imaging. There's um, spectral imaging, there's multispectral imaging, there's, there's, um, and there's a lot of, there's a little bit of research too that goes into uh, testing in this area. So the conservation lab is, I, I call it the science, the scientific area where mm -hmm. things like that happen. Yeah, this is, it's, it's a fantastic lab. We've got um, a head conservator and, a, and an assistant conservator and they take care of all of the collections. So anything from books uh, to papers, to silver gelatin photographs, to 
uh, daguerreotypes to things on glass, uh, even cameras. So there's there's leather, there's brass, there's all sorts of stuff. And you can imagine with a collection, uh, the, the bulk of our museum's collection, we have a large uh, section that's 19th century and early 20th. So, you know, as with all, you know, collections, there's there's deterioration that happens over time. So. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the work that's done in the conservation lab is about um, trying to mitigate that type of deterioration to make the object safe to handle, safe to display. Got it. Uh, these, all of these, but I think you know this one uh, especially could, like you said, would be really great for uh, for education purposes. You know, taking uh, school school trips, all right, especially anyone uh, learning about photography. Um, this would be a really really. Uh, cool thing to to look at and get a, a virtual tour through these spaces. I, I don't want to speak too early, but I think there are plans to do a behind the, a fuller behind the scenes tour guided by the conservators of the conservation lab. So they'll they'll be able to um, highlight you know certain things that they're working on or different areas of particular interest. So. Is there uh, is there more uh, to the lab area than than what we're seeing here in these two rooms? Uh, it's, it's mainly these two rooms. Okay. Very, very cool. Um, love going through these spaces. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that was that was uh, super helpful. Uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, tackle some questions because I do see a lot of them going, uh, a lot of them are coming in. So first question is, uh, what camera and related tech uh, are you using to capture this? Uh, so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, this was done with the Matterport Pro 2. We're using the Matterport Pro 1 uh, and the, the Matterport platform. Uh, so that's pretty much, uh, it's an all-in-one solution. Uh, we, I mean, prior to us getting into virtual tours, we had, you know, done some preliminary things here and there. And we, we talked about, you know, developing our own in-house platform and all of that kind of thing. But um, when we came across Matterport, it seemed like it was, you know, given that in many museums and smaller institutions too, there's always that uh, struggle with you know time and resources and how much you know you can you can put into stuff like uh, you know developing in-house things. And so uh, we found the Matterport. It's it's working great for us, um, and it, it it's doing what we need it to do. So quick question about how somebody, because again, we've, you know, a lot of, a lot of photographers, if they do want to uh, approach a uh, museum with this service, like offering Matterport and, and the benefits that, you know, you talked about offering, uh, you know, education tours to schools and so on and so forth, who's the right person to talk to in a museum organization? <laughs> and, and, and what do you think the best way would be to, to approach that? I mean, you guys are doing it in-house, but, but other um, museums are probably not going to uh, have that ability. Big question. Um, <laughs> I guess it, it depends on... Your suggestion. I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I will say, as somebody who's within the museum, uh, I, I work with all departments. So, I, I mean, I guess it depends on the goals of the museum. If they're... If their goal is mostly towards uh, marketing engagement in this particular, in a particular time frame, then I would say maybe reach out to the marketing and engagement team. Um, but if their goals are more uh, veered towards uh, collection strategies, then I mean reaching out to curators, collection managers, that's also a possibility too. Um, but if it's say it's if it's more of an institution that has more uh, conservation-oriented goals, then. It sort of depends on the museum. Um, and I guess as someone who's on the inside, I would say a lot of people have a stake in how the museum is presented to the world. So yeah, um, right off the top of my head though, I think the sort of the outward facing one is definitely marketing and engagement since they do have an out, most places with a marketing and engagement team have a outward facing presence. So this would fall under that umbrella easily. Yeah, and then from there, you can say, oh, by the way, you can also use it in these other, you know, use cases, uh, like you know, e-commerce in your gift shop or whatever. You can start, you know, making stuff up uh, uh, that you know would work for whatever that museum's needs are. Like you said, everyone is kind of has has their set of uh, priority levels. So start with uh, kind of marketing aspect, uh, reaching out, kind of expanding your um, 
I guess your your reach, uh, not just you know with local people who can come in, visitors uh, in town, but also anybody online can now really visit your facility. Do you find that you've been able to uh, add members to your member base who you know people who are not in New York and and you know in the area are they are they like just virtual or do you think that's still too early for that? It's a good question. Um, I I don't have a formal answer for that. Um, I know that we have had an uptick in membership, so I I don't know if that's entirely based on newly offering virtual tours. Um, I'd like to think that it, the virtual tours have helped, um, but uh, we do also we've always had many members from around the globe too so it's um, got it okay it might be a little too early to say definitively if virtual tours are the driving factor let's see what else we have here how much do you adjust height of the camera for specific artworks or do you keep it uniform throughout yeah go ahead that's a great question thank you um typically i keep it at about eye level so uh, well, let me say, I guess eye level is different for everyone, but um, the, the recommended um, height level that Matterport's training is recommended. Uh, however, in the case of things in vitrines, particularly, uh, I will lower the camera so that it, it sort of focuses uh, down into the vitrine so that if someone were to walk into that spot, they would see it as if they were seeing it in person. So yeah, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of adjustment to, to uh, I don't want to say compensate, I guess to to make it as realistic as possible um, mm -hmm. for someone walk, walking through the digital space. Yeah, normally people would be at their height, but like you said, if they are coming up to something that they would normally, you know, duck down or lower, you know, to, to get a better uh, look at it. Uh, will there be any persistent audio tour features so someone can continue roaming as they listen? I know there are third-party companies. Uh, we've got platform partners who can do, uh, who can integrate full audio tours uh, into your Matterport model. Uh, I, I don't know if that's something that you know, actually, Elizabeth, but uh, we have uh, platform partners that as you're walking through, um, different audio tracks can start playing. So it, it, it's, it's aware of your location within the virtual space and it plays whatever audio needs to be playing. You know, someone talking about whatever it is you're looking at at the time, uh, which is, I think, really beneficial, especially in a museum use case. Something definitely to, to think about for anybody who's looking to, you know, talk to museums, that, that's definitely something available. Is there anything you do that can feed into your SEO for the people who view the tours. Are you guys at uh, Eastman looking at SEO and how the tours are and how long, I mean, the fact that people stay longer in a tour, that helps. But is that something that you guys are, are you know, actively engaged in and, and really trying to you know, optimize as much as possible the uh, the level of um, search engine optimization and, and marketing value out of their tours? I want to say it's a yes and no. Um, we, we are still pushing the physical exhibition as the main thing. I want to say for now, it's only been, uh, we, we only really seriously started this in about 2020, so it's only been yeah. a year and a bit, so... Uh, I, I want to say at the moment, there's there, yes and no. <laughs> um, it's, it's not the only thing that we're driving forward. So it's, it, the goal is still to bring visitors into the, into the museum, um, to, you know, have people on site to visit and all that kind of thing. And this is, uh, this was sort of a necessary, but also uh, a cherry on top of the cake kind of extra thing. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that fully answers the question, but um, that's where we're at. I feel like we are still a little early in the game, um, mm -hmm. having only been doing this seriously for about you know, just over a year. Uh, would you um, have your virtual tours as kind of um, 
a lead in to actually coming in? I mean, obviously your, your end goal is to have them physically come in to the museum and not, not just become this, you know, only virtual space. Do you use it as kind of like a, uh, I don't know, like a tease in a way? Uh, here's a part of what we have to offer. If you want to see more, you got to come in sort of thing. No, I don't think that we're using this as a teaser at all. Um, the, the full exhibitions are online and the full mansion tour is online. So uh, visitors, when they go on the site, they're, they're welcome to peruse and browse and walk through at their leisure. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that right now we're sort of seeing it as a, it's an addition to the way that we're documenting what we're doing in the physical space. And the bonus of that is that, yes, it does increase viewership in, in, in certain ways. I, I'm not 100% sure if that's the sole you know, goal of what we're doing with the virtual tours. It's, it's part and yeah. parcel of a larger, uh, larger picture. Got it, got it, makes perfect sense. So what Matterport subscription level do you have uh, when it comes to you archive uh, digital twins? Do you host them uh, on your own Matterport account or do you outsource that? Um, I think you, you guys have your own Matterport account. You're not uh, dealing with an outsourced um, account. We do have our own Matterport account. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the subscription level is. Sorry, this would be something my, my okay. colleagues in the marketing <laughs> engagement team take care of. I right. get to have all the fun and they get to deal with the paperwork and such. Um, but yes, we do have our own Matterport account. So we are maintaining um, our own access um, to all of these things. So, yeah. Brilliant. Um, sorry, Darwin, we, we won't uh, <laughs> get to know what level of uh, subscription we have. Um, what considerations uh, went in to the, uh, to the thought of 360 walkthroughs as archive documentation? Have you considered long-term access to the files over decades? Um, have you guys had any of those meetings about, I don't personally see any reason why they would uh, you know, go away at any time, but uh, uh, archiving any assets maybe from the digital twins? That is a fantastic question and definitely something, especially in museum, uh, a museum atmosphere that we, we talked about extensively. Um, we're not the first museum to venture into virtual tours, whether with this platform or another one. Um, I think many places have done it before. Uh, what prompted us to do it was March, 2020, you know, museum being closed to on, uh, physical visitors you know, sort of shook things up a little bit for our um, community engagement um, and all that kind of thing. So we wavered a lot. I want to say like, honestly, there are great arguments on both sides. You know, you make these tours, you have to keep them in perpetuity. There's all of these additional assets. There's the, 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 the 3D model itself. There's the individual um, the scans and all of that. And you need server space. You need someone to manage the digital assets that come from all of this. And so we also knew too that there wouldn't be a perfect answer. And we could talk indefinitely about the pros and the cons of this and that. And we may never come to a great solution. So we decided that um, we were just going to go for it. Um, that knowing right off the bat that it started off as sort of, uh, we used to, well, sorry, I don't want to get too garbled here. We started off not using the Matterport uh, Pro One. We actually used an off the shelf 360 camera. Mm -hmm. And we did a couple of early tours with that, knowing that, you know, the quality was, it was okay, but it wasn't fantastic, but it gave us something. And then from there, we were able to make a case for applying for a grant to get um, a Matterport camera and then a, a fuller subscription to continue to do this once we were able to show uh, sort of the, the, the museum administration that, you know, this is something that is doable, that is feasible. Uh, so again, you know, uh, progress over perfection, I guess, is what we sort of came out of all of the meetings we came out of, you know, we ended up with that is that, we need to do something and there's no harm in testing something, seeing if it works. And then being also fully aware that yes, we, we have built in um, more space on our internal servers and our backup servers to be able to store, store the models, um, 
we've opened the box for this now, so now we're in it. Uh, yep. I don't know. That, I hope that fully answers some of the question. So. No, that's great. That's great. Um, but it's, it sounds like, uh, you know, you did it because of the pandemic, obviously, which I think definitely, you know, advanced the whole uh, case for having a digital twin uh, of your space or whatever it is that, that you want, um, you know, by probably several years. But now, you you know, like you said, you know, membership is, is up um, and more engagement and people are spending time in the virtual tours and it's providing you know, interested parties with a way of experiencing it um, before they actually get there to see it, to see it firsthand. They can, they can get a much better idea of the facility this way uh, versus, you know, pictures and the blog kind of ways of the past, I suppose. So this is something that you're saying you're, you're going to stick with. This is not something that, uh, you know, as soon as everything opens up and we're officially back to, you know, normal, whatever that new normal is going to be, it's you don't see this as going away anytime soon. No, I think we virtual definitely, tours. Yeah. we're definitely going to be sticking with it. Um, it provides a it's it's actually wonderful in terms of accessibility for people to preview the space so that they know how to um, what to expect when they're here navigating physically or to know like, oh, there may be things about the space that aren't navigatable for them physically mm -hmm. or something like that. So that is one of the one of the uh, one of the other parts of this is that giving people a preview of the space is is not is 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 actually a great thing. It's having random surprises is, you know, sometimes type surprises are good, but you know sometimes surprises aren't great. So uh, I I like to think of these as they are previews, um, but they're not closed previews. They're they're definitely previews to allow people to experience it and to know what they're getting into. Also allowing, like, you know, we mentioned uh, member tours of areas that are not open to the general public, uh, but also, like you said, getting getting the, the preview of, of a space and, and I think just getting you more excited about it, more excited about seeing it firsthand. Definitely for sure with the, the photography and uh, the photography ex exhibitions that are up. There's nothing quite like looking at an exhibition in person, seeing, yeah. seeing prints, seeing, um, seeing books, seeing bound volumes, seeing things in person. It's, there's something very, very um, visceral about that. It's something very unique. Um, but that's not to say that a, you know, a, digital, uh, a digital twin uh, mm -hmm. or a digital uh, online tour can't try to emulate some of that. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, we're, we are definitely going to be continuing with this, that's, that's for sure, because I think we've started and now it's hard to stop. So, For, you know, some folks who would argue, and I've, I've definitely heard plenty of counter arguments, and I know it's still early to tell because you only started this in 2020 when everything was kind of going down and, uh, and restrictions and whatnot, you know, to those who say, if I offer this virtual tour of my museum, then what's, you know, how is that? It's only gonna take away from the people who, who come and, and see it, you know, in real life. Uh, so they kind of see it as a deterrent or something like that. Uh, what, what would you say to that? Is that like completely the opposite of what, or is there anything? I, as someone who's, been a lifelong visitor to many museums and galleries and archives and libraries. Um, I think it comes down to access. I think it comes down to, it's not just about the people that walk through the doors, but it is about the people that walk through the doors, but it's not just about the people who can see this online, but it is also about the people who can see this online. And it comes down to, this is a this is a public space. This is a museum. We have, a, we have historic collections that pertain to the history of film and photography. And we have a lot of unique objects that may not always get a big chance to be um, exhibited or shown or traveled or anything like that. And uh, it's, it's part of you know, the, the history of film and photography. And it's something that I think if visitors were keen on coming through the doors, they're already doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it helps make the museum more for everyone. I feel like that's what it comes yeah. to. 
So it's a that's important too. Um, yeah, that it's, mind. it's a net positive. Without you can't you can't say for sure that oh everybody now is is you know going to also visit. There might be you know those uh, that sector that the few whatever uh, number of people who would be like okay I saw the virtual tour I'm 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 happy, uh, but you're saying most people who get a you know different sense um, from actually being there, from seeing it, um, you know, from smelling it, it's a different experience. Uh, and this would should not detract from that. Let's see here. When capturing museum space, lighting, tone, et cetera, is very important, right? Uh, you know, color balance, things like that. Uh, a white cube space is... Uh, cold light versus this Eastman Museum with warmer tones. Are there any plans to allow for changes in color temperature or levels uh, model wide? I don't know of anything, Chris, uh, in as far as Matterport is concerned, but there are some tools. There's a free uh, platform partner called MP Embed, and you can go and check it out. A, a lot of their tools are, are free to use, and I do believe that uh, adjusting the tone and color, things like that, is one of those tools. Don't take my word for it. You should check it out yourself, mpembed.com, I believe. Uh, but they can help you out with that. So you basically feed your Matterport model through MP Embed, and they allow you to go, um, I, I, I want to say one scan at a time, but, but maybe it is uh, an overall global uh, change that you can make as well. I'm honestly not sure, uh, but definitely check that out. Has anyone looked into a uh, polarizing filter? Yes, uh, I actually have personally. Uh, that could be placed on the front of the Matterport uh, to reduce reflections and so on in photography as polarizing filters are used. Um, yeah, I can't, nothing. Can't, can't find anything. <laughs> I've tried uh, to figure out, uh, you know, polarizing gels. Problem is the ideal way, uh, as you know, for, uh, you know, combating reflections and things like that is using a circular polarizer and you can't see what's going on with Matterport. You can with your DSLR, but you, you would have no idea like which way to turn it and, and whatnot. So that would make things very complicated. Uh, if you do just get a, uh, you know, linear polarized gels, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how ideal that would be, to be honest. I've never actually tested it personally, but I haven't found anything that can easily be adapted to it. So there'd be a lot of customization work, maybe some 3D printing. Uh, you would not want to cover the entire camera. Uh, it is using infrared. So you don't want to block that from being able to be projected uh, as well as be uh, seen by the infrared sensors on the camera. Okay, how many scans do you do for a large space like this? Do you know roughly how many scans that uh, the, the mansion was? Okay, so it's not, uh, I mean, you know, we've, we've had scans come in with several hundred, um, even over a thousand, not that, you know, it's encouraged, but uh, yeah, okay, so it's not, an, it's not like a very, very high number of uh, scan positions. Do you tend to over scan with your models and then go through, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and hide anything that is, you know, relevant and uh, not necessary? For navigation? Yes, I, I definitely do. And I think that this might, I have an interesting uh, case study for that that might be relevant to the last question about reflections. So in our current exhibition, uh, Joshua Rashad McFadden, I believe I'll run on, there's a dual-sided projection screen that's part of the exhibition. However, when the projection screen is on, it reflects and it casts light on the artwork that's you know opposite it. So what I did in that case was I did that space with the projection screen off, and then I did the same spots again with the projection screen on. And then when the model was completed, we selectively turned off the uh, different, well, select uh, ones either with the projection screen off or on, depending on where the main uh, points were. So if some, if that, if the scan point was in front of a piece of art that needed the projection screen to be off, we you know, take the one with the, the off. But once, you know, you, you turned and you walked and you stood in front of the projection screen, it would be on again. Not a perfect solution by any means, but 
a, a workaround. I feel like it, you know, worked for what we needed it to do. So. Yeah, reflections are tough, and certainly in in museum, you know, you've got a lot of glass that you need to deal with. So that is certainly a challenge. I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't. I don't even think three hundred and sixty cameras would have that. I don't even know that. I suppose you know what with access that was uh, just you know announced and i think released uh yesterday your phone couldn't you uh, i know your phone has a uh, little uh, accessories and adapters I, I don't know about circular polarizers on phones but maybe in certain locations or areas of a museum where there's you know a lot of reflection then using that to fill in those spaces i don't know i'm just trying to think out loud and brainstorm uh possibilities uh that could be interesting because i don't think there's anything for 360 cameras that uh, there's no way so before we are over our time, uh, does the museum also have uh, temporary exhibits? Uh, I believe, yes. And do you scan the entire museum every time, including temporary exhibits, or do you have a different scanning uh, schedule for temporary versus permanent exhibits? We talked a little bit about the exhibits that you do scan and archive. When you do that, do you scan uh, the entire museum at, at one again, or just, just the exhibit? We so when I go in for each exhibition, um, and these would be the ones that have a set beginning and an end date, so I guess in a sense temporary. Um, I I only do the exhibition space, so from the from the entryway to the yeah within that space, we'll we'll scan each time. Uh, we've only got hmm, I guess the house in and of itself is considered a permanent exhibition. It's permanently there. Um, so far, we've only done one full, full-on scan of the historic mansion, and then the the holiday one is just sort of like a bonus one. We may do that again. I don't know if we'll do it necessarily anytime soon. It's it, it was quite the production to get everything moved and set up. Yeah, I guess within our within our institution, it's um, sort of a balance between time and how much things are changing. I mean, if there are grand and extreme changes to the house for whatever reason, or if we we end up restoring a large section or we end up acquiring pieces that you know are are particularly unique that go into the historic mansion then we'll probably think about doing that um, in its in its full entirety uh, but for the exhibitions that have the a set beginning and a set end date it's definitely just the the exhibition itself okay heather says uh, i work at a museum and we have been using matterport for the past two years uh, we have struggled with the uh, functionality of the matter tags in terms of uh, effectively showing the text and our uh, didacted labels, character limits, formatting, et cetera. Uh, do you have any tips for making effective use of the matter tags? Uh, that is a very good question, Heather, and probably I mean, if you're having issues with the matter tags, I would be very interested in knowing a little bit more about what that issue looks like and maybe we can you know come to a resolution um you're definitely more than welcome to reach out to support at uh, support at uh, and mention my name and then we can we can look at those i would be interested to see like what's what exactly is going on so we can we can take a look at that do people use the models on their mobile during uh live visits is that something that you've seen that's interesting um I wonder if there's any kind of like AR ways of, of enhancing the live visit, uh, you know, I don't know, make it a gamifying it in, in a way, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not sure. Sounds intriguing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know if I've actually, Nothing. I mean, it's hard to tell. People are on their phones all the time. So maybe they are doing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, sounds intriguing. Yeah, for sure. Um, it would be, a, I mean, I, I don't know that it's necessary, but it definitely would be a way of integrating the audio tour while they're there, because I know you can synchronize the model, the Matterport model with the person actually going through. So they would be actually able to sort of, you know, see AR, but also uh, just, just here based on their location in the physical space, it would synchronize that with their digital twin and it would know where they are and play the sound accordingly, just like I was describing earlier with uh, as you're in the virtual space, as you get to a location, it plays certain audio that kind of explains what it is you're looking at. It would be very similar. They can just kind of move their phone around. It takes a couple of measurements, aligns and kind of clicks in the, the model so it knows where you're at. And as you move around, it just figures it out. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't know how 
uh, the audio tour right now, you, we saw the QR codes in your model. I don't know how that works. Is that something that they have to scan at every location? Uh, they would have to scan and, or they can just dial in and just follow the, the, the punch codes to, okay. to follow it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, to have something that's integrated as they walk through that definitely is. It's possible. Yeah, it's definitely something that's, that's po certainly possible uh, right now. Uh, and not that it's a, you know, issue scanning a QR code, but they could either scan a QR code or they could just, like I said, turn on their app and, uh, and move the phone around, thereby it grabs measurements and then it, align, it clicks that into the uh, model. It's pretty neat, actually. Uh, there are a couple of platform partners uh, doing that. So also something to think about for everybody out there. Did you try a number of separate areas or one large area that people could roam around in? Uh, also, did you put any Easter eggs in your scene? Uh, we did secret surprises in some of our scenes, in some of our scans. Uh, did you add any surprise uh, Easter eggs in your in your Matterport models? Um, <laughs> I mean, unless unless someone, uh, you know, sometimes there's like a person in the way far background, but most of the time, that, no. <laughs> the, the short answer is no, we don't have any Easter eggs. Um, the closest one that we have, I guess, is that the mansion at the holidays is that we deliberately actually put physical little gift wrap boxes and that was meant for people to go through to find them. That could be cool um, for like holiday scans just for fun. I don't know. Maybe even Easter. Uh, we did that with, uh, with an exhibition just as the pandemic hit. Uh, an artist uh, opened her exhibition in New York and... Um, and we did that. We did like a kind of gamified the, the model to, to look. It was like an Alice in Wonderland theme place. I can I'll maybe send it to you. Uh, it's pretty neat. So you try to find the bunnies. Since using Matterport camera is a uh, pretty automatic process, uh, procedure, what is the benefit of having a professional photographer complete the process? Um, yes, it is pretty automated. It's certainly as far as when you think of photography, you know, you've got a, like a DSLR, you think aperture priority shutter, you know, all, you know, white balance and all these different things that come into play with photography, Elizabeth, as you know, with Matterport, it's a point and shoot. But I think as you, you're very familiar with the space, you're very familiar with how people engage in the space. And uh, as a photographer, you wanted to bring that perspective to your Matterport models. And so uh, it's not that you have to be a photographer, I don't think you do, but I do think <clears throat> you do want to have, I guess, an idea of how you want people and what you want people to see as they're navigating their way through the virtual space. It's not so much uh, technical photography know-how as it is, um, you know, knowing your visitors and, and what they're going to want to see and how they're going to how they're going to want to experience the space. I think familiarity with the location is probably key. Um, it is. It is, yeah, it is very much point and click. Um, I, I don't get a lot of chances to frame anything because it just captures everything. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, to a certain extent, I can move the tripod up and down, but, um, and yeah, it's about being familiar with the space and also knowing how, I guess having a photography background, being a photographer means that you sort of have a sense of what angles work and what angles don't, um, and then where to break those rules. How much do virtual tours assist you uh, engaging with local education institutions and do they use the tours as an alternative to visiting or as a follow-up activity? Do you know? I mean, I know we talked about education tours and schools and whatnot visiting and I'm guessing you're or somebody at the museum is hosting those via something like Zoom. Do, do you know anything about how they're, you know, continue to, to use those? We are definitely trying to encourage, you know, student groups question pertains to student groups specifically to use the tours as a way of visiting without being on site. Um, but I don't know if it's it necessarily always plays into a before and after kind of thing, because we don't actually take the tours down. So it's we have tours of the exhibitions from way back in like the beginning. So sometimes you know school groups, school groups don't actually interact with the exhibitions until they're long over. Or whatever reason, or you know, like say thematically, maybe they're talking about something that's thematically related to an older exhibition, and so mm -hmm. they can go back and you know look for those and uh, use that as a learning tool for that. Uh, so the timing 
insofar as like before and after follow up, it's probably a bit hard to say. Yeah. I mean, follow up, I suppose you wouldn't know, you know, what they, what they do, but certainly a, you know, good use case for archiving all the exhibitions, right? Because you never know when the school is going to, you know, be on that uh, topic and need to check out this exhibit, uh, this uh, exhibition to kind of back up whatever it is they're, uh, they're learning about. That's cool. All right. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Really, really appreciate your time, taking the time uh, to be with us today, Elizabeth. Huge, huge thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you uh, to all the attendees. I, I apologize for not being able to get to all your uh, great questions. And, uh, and we'll hope to see you next time. I hope you got uh, some value out of this. And uh, we do these Shop Talk webinars every, uh, the first ones of every month. So do join uh, at the next one. And uh, again, Elizabeth, huge thank you. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.